United States before I made my way here to uh, South Dakota was really formative. And, and so uh, I've thought a lot about kind of Colorado and the waters there. And interestingly, many years ago, I, I met uh, the late Colorado Supreme Court Justice Greg Hobbs. And he uh, also being an attorney, he was also a writer, a poet. And uh, he writes a, a collection of books, uh, or excuse me, poems entitled Colorado, The Mother of Rivers. And it's a, a book that celebrates uh, Colorado and its waters and its land. And that particular idea, Colorado is the mother of rivers, uh, is very much celebrated uh, in this slide here. This is a, a painting by Alan Tupper True. Uh, it was uh, commissioned uh, along with a number of other, seven other murals. And this is in the Colorado State Capitol building. And it's part of this series, The History of Water, and uh, kind of begins with a, an image of a Native American man and kind of progresses through history, supposedly, uh, through kind of pioneers and miners and then into more modern times. And this is the last uh, mural, uh, and it's entitled um, For Tomorrow. And you can see some lines uh, of, of writing below that. And those are by Thomas Hornsby Farrell, who was a, another Colorado uh, artist. He was a, a poet, a uh, well-known writer in the state. And uh, it says, beyond the sundown is tomorrow's wisdom. Today is going to, to be uh, long, long ago. And so what I want to think a little bit about and, and what I try to do in the book is to, to think about tomorrow's wisdom as it relates to water issues and particularly water issues in the Colorado River Basin, uh, which again is a place that I've both traveled uh, along the river um, on the water itself physically, but also then thinking about it over, over many years. Uh, but then I do wanna make some comments toward the end just to think about water issues more broadly and perhaps think a little bit about some of the issues along the South Platte, which is uh, obviously really important to, to Nebraska. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little bit of historical context for the problems uh, that we're addressing and that I'm thinking through related to uh, the river. And then consider some different ideas or, or theories that I see as being helpful to addressing these issues. And then spend some time uh, applying these various ideas uh, to consider what they actually do for us and how they, they offer some uh, alternative perspectives for us to consider. And then, as I mentioned, I'll conclude with some uh, broader comments about uh, rivers. So I want to turn the clock back about 100 years, almost 100 years ago exactly. Um, next Thursday, uh, obviously it's Thanksgiving, but we'll be commemorating another very important day uh, within the history of the Colorado River watershed. On ninth, or, uh, November the 24th, 1922, uh, representatives from Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona, and California met to sign the Colorado River Compact. And this is the foundational document that really has spelled out how the, the river would be developed over the next century. This compact, like many of the different deliberations that were in place to get to this place of compromise, um, uh, was something that uh, was a long time coming. And there was a lot of negotiation, a lot of posturing by the different politicians and uh, all these different individuals. Uh, involved in these uh, negotiations. And eventually what they came up with was this division of the waters. Uh, all the different states wanted a piece of the Colorado. They were concerned that you know their country or their uh, states are going to grow. We need water for agriculture, for cities. And so uh, they decided to divide up the river. And part of that was figuring out how much water is actually in the river. And there's a very long history about all of this, but Ultimately, they kind of decided on basic uh, a number of about 16.5 million acre feet. And an acre foot is if you took a football field and filled it with water about a foot high, that's what an acre foot is. Okay, It's about 325,000 gallons, uh, which is a lot of water. Um, but if you compare it to the Missouri River, for example, the Missouri discharges about 40 million acre feet a year. So they were thinking the Colorado had about 16.5 substantial amount, but certainly not as much as some of our other major rivers. The problem was this particular uh, quantity wasn't entirely based on exact science. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, again, kind of posturing and boosters saying, hey, there's actually a lot more water, so we can divide it up and our state will get more. 
but this number 16.5 has, has stuck. The problem with this, as I noted, was that it wasn't based on, on sound science. And this is an excellent book uh, by Eric Kuhn uh, and John Fleck. Um, Eric's in uh, Colorado and John's down at the University of New Mexico. He's a journalist. And, and they wrote this book exploring kind of this controversy and how there was actual good science at the time that they signed the compact in the 20s, but that the, the leaders really didn't want to, to buy into that. Um, so this discrepancy in the actual amount and then the amount that went on paper really hasn't been too much of an issue because we haven't been able to use all that water up until about now. Um, the compact signers had no idea what circumstances we would be facing today, and we find ourselves in a rather difficult position. So I want to outline just some of those different issues here. Here's a map of the watershed uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with it. So you can see that it, the water, the rivers start in the Rocky Mountains and then make their way down to the Gulf of, of Mexico. And the river supplies the needs for about one in 10 Americans or about 40 million people in places like Albuquerque, Denver, Salt Lake, Phoenix, uh, Vegas, San Diego, Los Angeles, and then uh, some cities in Northern uh, Mexico. And as you may know, some of these states and these cities have been the fastest growing in the United States. Uh, so a lot of pressure just in terms of growth. Uh, another significant factor is that the river produces uh, or waters most of the produce and agriculture uh, that we get in the winter months, okay? Um, and so if you are eating greens, lettuce or you know, other things like that this holiday season, you are probably eating Colorado River water. Um, so uh, a huge amount of money, um, over a trillion dollars is generated by the river in terms of both agriculture, recreation, tourism, et cetera. But starting in 2000, the basin is, as well as much of the American West has been uh, plagued in what scientists are now calling a mega drought. Uh, it's the worst drought in the last 1200 years. So that's obviously a, a rather significant issue to deal with. And what that has done, this drought, is it has drawn down the nation's two largest reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, uh, in kind of the Arizona, Nevada border, and then the Arizona, Utah border. And this drought, uh, which has been, again, ongoing since uh, 2000, has drawn down these water levels and has had huge impacts in terms of the deliveries of this water to many, many users. Um, and right now, I think the reservoirs are at about 27 and 25% uh, full, respectively. It's the lowest they've, they've been since they filled many, many decades ago. And so this is gonna have huge impacts uh, on local economies. Um, and things like hydropower, okay? These, these dams generate quite a bit of hydropower um, for electricity, for running uh, air conditioning. And if you've ever traveled to Arizona uh, in the summertime, it's not a nice place to be and uh, pretty rough if you don't have an air conditioner. Uh, and the worry is that the reservoirs are becoming so low that it's really difficult to generate um, hydroelectricity. So there's a number of things that are happening right now to kind of boost the water levels. Uh, even though we're not getting the same amounts of pre precipitation that we have been in the past. So these are some of the, the very kind of physical, um, you know, kind of material uh, issues that, that we're facing in terms of uh, urbanization and just demands uh, on the river by increased population, but then also the impacts of climate change. But I want to spend some time talking about some other issues that I think are really significant in the issues that we're facing today. And a lot of these have to do with beliefs that have been circulating in our, our country, in the region for, for a really long time. Um, and what I'm talking about are these basically 19th century myths uh, about the American West. One of those has to do with the frontier, right? That we have looked at the American West as this place to expand, to grow, to kind of fill our dreams, uh, a place of conquest. Uh, where there's just open land for the taking. And this is uh, excellently captured here in John Gast's painting from 1872, where you, know, you can kind of see the light coming from the east, moving to the west, pushing out supposed savagery and a lack of civilization. And this uh, woman here, you can't really see that from where you're at, but it says school book in her arm and she's carrying the telegraph wire, right? So civilization and enlightenment is, is coming to the west. 
Um, and that's what Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893 was very much thinking when he uh, talked about his frontier thesis. Another issue here is the idea of the American West as a garden. Uh, there was this belief, right, at one point it was the great American desert, uh, but if we could put water on it, if we could reclaim it, we could create what uh, Mark Fiji, he's a historian, he's called this the irrigated Eden, right? And as you're driving across Nebraska, if you're in the eastern part of the state, you know that it's uh, more humid and greener. And as you get about halfway across the state, right, it turns drier. And so this is the land beyond the 100th meridian. Once you get west of that, things get drier and you have to irrigate. Uh, of course, we are seeing that, that line move uh, east a little bit more and, and more and more people having to irrigate just because of, of drought. Uh, the final myth here is this idea of wilderness. And initially, right, wilderness in this country was seen as something to fear uh, when Europeans were first settling here. But certainly within the 19th century and into the 20th, wilderness was seen as something that we needed to celebrate. And Thoreau was very much a part of this, right? He talked about how wildness is the, pre is the preservation of the world. Uh, we have the 1964 Wilderness Act. And so there's this celebration of these kind of wild, pristine places. Um, the problem is that for many, this has meant that what we think of as, as nature is very much separate from culture, right? Where we live is, is not in nature. So wilderness is always that thing out there, okay? And what I argue is these three different myths or perspectives have created a, a rather significant imbalance of representations um, within the region. And uh, it's led us to kind of favor certain perspectives that promote the frontier belief or the idea that the West is a garden and we need to kind of make it a uh, kind of this irrigated Eden uh, while overlooking other approaches. So the big question is, you know, what do we do? What do we do to address both the material factors, the, the lack of water, but then also these uh, ideological perspectives? How do we have a shift in, in beliefs? And to, to answer the first question, the issues of you know, kind of less water in the system and these climate factors, you know, I think it's safe to say that most people would say that science is the answer, right? That we need um, the best science out there and we need more of that. And lately I've been attending a number of different conferences uh, in the West that predominantly are, are uh, attended by lawyers, uh, policymakers, and, and scientists. And there's a lot of really, really smart people working on these particular issues. And that's absolutely what we need. But I don't feel like it's, it's adequate, right? There's other things that need to be part of that, that conversation. Um, we need to cast a wider net to bring in other uh, expertise and disciplines to help us really make sense of, of what we're dealing with. And this, is a, this particular issue that I'm getting at here is something that's been uh, written about and echoed by a number of different scholars. So this is a perspective by uh, a Swedish um, scholar, academic named Sverker Sorlin. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. But he suggests here that in a world where cultural values, political and religious ideas, and deep-seated human behavior still rule the way people lead their lives, produce, and consume, the idea of environmentally relevant knowledge must change. And I think that's that's really important, right? That we need to be focusing on people and their ideas um, to help create these really drastic shifts that we need to see, okay? Um, and I think this is especially important today when the idea of data um, is so politicized and we talk about fake news and, right, people are having a very hard time kind of identifying uh, who are the experts, right? What, what are the real issues? Um, again, here's a statement. This is from a professor of geography and environmental systems who wrote in the New York Times recently talking about this, this issue, you know, which, which are the experts that we need to trust um, and that scientific narratives are, are not the sole way for us to solve these problems. He concludes, in the end, it is people and their institutions, not science that will decide the future. And I think for those of us in the humanities, this is kind of a heartening thing, right? That, that we need to be part of this particular solution. Well, there's others who have um, continued to, to talk about this. This is a historian, April Summit, in her environmental history uh, about the Colorado River from 2013. Uh, she asked these questions. Why do people press on with unsustainable policies 
in the face of impending disaster, right? There are so many headlines right now. If you Google Colorado River, you know, issues, drought, and there's article after article about all the problems and the facts and the numbers about how we're drawing down the reservoirs and everything else going on. But is that changing people's behavior? Um, and I would suggest that in many cases, no, it's not. Then finally, when I was uh, at a law symposium at the University of Denver in 2018, uh, one of the faculty there was talking about the need for greater equality and equity and inclusion when it comes to access and use of water resources. And he suggested that the problem there is that we don't have a common language or a common framework when it comes to talking about water in the arid west. There's so many different uh, you know, perspectives. There's these old myths and, and right, the kind of the, the status quo that's been in place for, for many years that have neglected a lot of uh, important perspectives and left a lot of people out of the, the negotiation uh, discussion. So that's what I'm trying to get at here is that, again, we need, a, we need a new framework. And this is where I see the environmental humanities coming in. Uh, this is a, an area uh, that's a rapidly growing field focused um, on the study of human imagination, perception, behaviors, and the relationship of humans to their surrounding environments, both social and natural. Um, and as one working in this field, I, I'm really uh, inspired and optimistic about the contributions that uh, such fields like history and literature, art, philosophy, among many others, can make to rethinking our relationships to the river. And I, I love this particular phrase, uh, humanists at the head gates. Uh, this is a, a phrase from social ecologist Helen Ingram, and she talks about the need to take humanism at the head gates. And if you're uh, familiar with, you know, an irrigation ditch and somebody kind of controlling where the water goes, right? That's the head gate. And she's suggesting here that that's the role that, that humanists need to play, right? That when engineers, politicians, or economists have taken control of water resource decision-making, we get kind of one particular perspective. And she's arguing here that humanists can really help us see the rights of ordinary people and have greater participation uh, from many. And in doing so, we can become what uh, another historian, Donald Worcester, has noted as uh, we can become a more river adaptive people. Okay, so we need these different perspectives. So, in terms of from an environmental humanities perspective, trying to figure out, okay, what, what are the frameworks, what are the, the ideas that can help us navigate some of the environmental issues that we face today? Um, I, I draw some inspiration from this map here. This is a map that was produced by John Wesley Powell, the, the famous explorer uh, from the 19th century who traveled extensively throughout the American West. He went down the Colorado River in 1869 and then in 1872 and spent a lot of time primarily in Utah uh, coming to understand the geography of the region and the rivers. And this is what he envisioned in terms of the development of the American West. Obviously this looks very different from our map today, but he was recognizing how arid the American West was. And that if uh, states, if we wanted to call them that, if we organized essentially around watershed boundaries, there would be less contention in the future. Okay. Now, the way that we have it, if you're, again, familiar with Colorado, much of the water that Denver uses comes from the west, western slope of the Continental Divide. So it's water that would traditionally flow into the Gulf of California, but it's pumped through the mountains through many different diversions because most of the population is on the other side of the mountains. Okay, And that water is actually flows into the South Platte and then into the Missouri River and down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so he, he anticipated that there would be water wars, wa a lot of contention, if we didn't organize this way. Well, of course, we didn't, because that just didn't fit what politicians and boosters and, and others wanted. So, um, but this, I think this watershed map really inspires us to think more broadly. It helps us kind of take a, what I call a watershed perspective. Uh, to have a better sense of, of where our water comes from and our relationships to other individuals. So we're looking here at the watershed map, and this is a statement by uh, Philip Fradkin. He's a journalist who traveled throughout the entire watershed. 
starting at its headwaters up in Colorado and then on the Green River in Wyoming and making his way down to Mexico. And this is his kind of response to what he experienced. He says, you know, listening to and seeing how all these people use the river, he realized that everyone is just kind of talking in terms of, you know, this is my, this is my river. This is my little, little place. People very rarely were thinking of their relationships to people downstream. So to listen to the voices, one would never suspect that they were connected to the same river or that the Colorado led to Mexico and the expectations of its multitudes or after being last used in that country that it no longer emptied into the Gulf. And this was certainly my experience growing up in Colorado. I didn't really know what happened to the river beyond say kind of Moab, Utah, if you're familiar with that area and some of like where Arches National Park is um, because I hadn't been past that, I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't really know what it looked like as it got into Arizona and then uh, at the border of the US-Mexico uh, border there where the river essentially does stop and it's diverted into agriculture and below the dam, it's just dry riverbed essentially. Um, but uh, a number of years um, ago, uh, right when I was uh, finishing up as an undergraduate, I had the opportunity to participate in a water education trip uh, through International Project WET and we traveled all throughout the watershed uh, developing curriculum through for K through 12 students. And that gave me an incredibly different sense of the river. I was able to see all these different kind of perspectives and these different needs. And that really opened my eyes to uh, the various stakeholders that are involved. Of course, we can't all do that, right? To have this watershed perspective, it's impossible for all of us to do that kind of traveling. But as my mentor and colleague, George Hanley has suggested, Perception is the last great clean and renewable resource. And I love that, that idea, right? That it's, it's about perception, it's about awareness. And that as we cultivate that, we can be better positioned to address some of these different issues. So taking some of these experiences that I've had and reading um, you know, through the environmental humanities and, and being familiar with a variety of different texts about the Colorado River, I came to think of this, um, these various perspectives as what I call tributary voices or the, the neglected or the lesser known perspectives of the river that have traditionally been kind of forgotten, right? They're part of a backwater. They're not that important, but they're still there. And I like this slide here. This is the confluence of the Green and Colorado River in Canyonlands National Park in uh, Southeastern Utah. And you can see how the Green River entering from the, to the left there and then the bottom right is the Colorado. You see how they have different sediment loads, right? They're different colors. And I kind of think of these different perspectives and the, the broader discourse that we have about the Colorado River functioning in a similar matter. That you have kind of the dominant perspectives like those 19th century myths that continue to persist today. But then you have these other perspectives that kind of work alongside those at times. Other times they're pushing against them, but they're all being mixed up in this broader uh, consideration of, of the Colorado River. And so I'm very much interested in reclaiming those neglected perspectives and considering what they can add uh, to our knowledge. And part of this tributary voices paradigm is the role of story or narrative. Um, many of these different perspectives use story to uh, portray their, their relationships to the river, uh, which is very different from what we get in most Colorado River uh, kind of deliberations or management, right? You're getting law, you're getting policy statements, you're getting science, but I'm interested in the stories that people are telling about the river and how those might help us have a, have a shift, okay? Um, so and I think one of the reasons why this is so important is because the environmental problems that we have, as many of those earlier scholars were talking about, the environmental problems that we have are very much related to um, you know, the ways that we think about history and language and our kind of our imagination. So um, if as the problems that we're facing today, environmental problems are human caused problems, right? We need answers that originate from the same sources as those problems. So if our perceptions, beliefs and values are causing our water crises, then we need to have a reorientation in those things to find solutions. Um, and, and so that's essentially what I'm what I'm working toward here. 
So at this point, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time looking at some specific tributary voices and the ways that I'm thinking about them and, and how they can add to our um, to thinking of solutions. So one of these is the Latino Latina perspective uh, within the, the watershed. Historically outside the center of the West water order, yet nonetheless integral to the region's development over the past four centuries, Latinos have been seeking to take a more prominent role in the Colorado River's future. And uh, I wanna share, um, I'm gonna pull up a website here uh, briefly to show you kind of this film that I've uh, spent some time thinking about and analyzing. And basically what, what it does is it offers or highlights what we can call the, the rhetoric of the good life and the rhetoric of querencia, okay? And these are uh, alternative means of talking about and interacting with uh, the land and with the rivers that challenge the, the dominant practices that I've been talking about. And so while marginalization has kept Latinos on the periphery of Colorado River management, it's also reinforced a way of life expressed through the notion of the good life that Chicana scholar Priscilla Ibarra identifies within Mexican American environmental literature. While her analysis of good life writing is restricted to more literary texts, it's certainly applicable to, to um, this film and, and other texts uh, coming from Latinos talking about the river. So she teaches us that one of the most significant things that environmentalists can learn from the decolonial writings of Chicanas and Chicanos, among other peoples of color, is the fact that we never needed to become environmentalists in the first place. And we therefore have an array of strategies at our disposal for how to live with the earth. And I think that's, again, really important. She's saying we didn't have to become environmentalists in the first place. So many of these tributary voices, uh, they have this environmental ethic, just a part of who they are and part of their culture. It's not like we needed some political movement to all of a sudden say, now we care about the environment, right? This is always a part of, of who they are. So a lot of this is focusing on traditional knowledge pathways as opposed to, again, kind of these political transformations. So this is another statement by Ibarra where she defines the good life writing. And this is something that embraces the values of simplicity, sustenance, dignity, and respect. And they function to preserve mutually healthy relations among individuals and communities the values in good life writing implicitly integrate the natural environment as part of the community and thus cultivate a life-sustaining ecology for humans. So there's, again, this emphasis on dignity, respect, and, and communal values, which in many cases kind of challenge the, the view of the American West as this very individual uh, kind of place for rugged individualism to play out, okay? So that's the good life. Then there's this notion of querencia, and this is a term that describes an attitude or a way of life that speaks to one's relationship to place. And this is a term that has really old origin. It kind of traces its roots actually back to, to Arabic, uh, but was developed by the Spanish. Um, and it means essentially a place in which one was born or from where one proceeds. Um, according to Esteban Arellano, he's a New Mexican poet and historian uh, who recently passed away. He wrote extensively about Querencia, and he talks about it as that which gives us a sense of place, anchors us to the land, and makes us a unique people. And so there's very much this consideration that, you know, we've been on the land for a very long time. We have these deep relationships to it, and that we're taking care of this land for future generations, okay, land or, or water. Um, and so I, I see these two ideas of the good life and Querencia as being important kind of vocabularies or discourses for us to, to consider. Um, and so I'm gonna click out of here really quickly and let's see here. Is everybody seeing that website? Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Minimize that. Okay, so this film, Leche Miel or Milk or Honey, this is a 14 minute film uh, produced by Justin Clifton in 2017. You can just Google this. This is something that was uh, promoted or developed by the Hispanic Access Foundation and American Rivers, this joint project. Um, and it was a recipient of a number of awards. And it 
depicts uh, some farmers working in Yuma, Arizona, um, these families and other workers and the experiences that they have cultivating the fields um, and the communities there and how they have a relationship uh, with, the, with the Colorado River. And it focuses on a man uh, by the name of Jose Gonzalez, who it shows him leaving his home very early in the morning. And he's talking about uh, his past and the drug and alcohol issues that he had and how he, he prayed to God and said, you know, I want to devote my life to you. And he, he then starts referencing the Old Testament story of Moses and the promised land that talks about this place of milk and honey where that, where that flows, right? Um, and that's the place where uh, the people went after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So this, this show or short film becomes, again, kind of the celebration of these people who have found, found this wonderful place for them. Um, and throughout, there's kind of these beautiful scenes of you know, pastoral images of, of farms being cultivated and the, the mountains in the background. And it creates this very kind of idyllic, idyllic scene here. And there's certainly, you know, there's, there's obviously problems with the agricultural community and, and migrant labor and things like that. Uh, this film doesn't really get into that. It, it's more of a celebration um, of, of the life and, and the people working there. Um, and in doing so, there's very much the celebration of good life writing. Um, there's emphasis right on or these various organizations and families and, and individuals who have this deep connection to the Colorado River. Uh, the film transitions to then talking about this religious community uh, within Yuma, Arizona. It focuses on this evangelical church and, and their pastor named Victor Ben Alonso. And he talks about how the Colorado River is the life of Yuma. He says, it's where we live. We have jobs because of the Colorado River, um, but because of the drought and diminishing flows, he notes how you know there's been uh, serious concern about people losing their jobs and whatnot. And so he, as a pastor, has earned his uh, urged his congregation to become more proactive in recognizing their duty to be caretakers of the river, and to fulfill the command in Genesis to be good stewards of the blessings given to them. And so the film ends up developing uh, that kind of uh, narrative uh, for a little bit. And he asks at the end of his segment, if we don't care, if, uh, take care of our water, if we don't take care of our rivers, what inheritance are we leaving our grandchildren? So again, it's that very kind of forward thinking that uh, this community is doing. Uh, there's another little section that uh, focuses on a man named Louis Gordias. He lives in a community just a little ways away from Yuma. And his section, is more of a kind of reflecting back on what the river used to be. He talks about how his grandma used to cross the, the Colorado River at Yuma in a paddle boat. Um, and he says, now you just need some high boots and you walk across. So at one point it used to be like a, an ocean uh, and now it's just a trickle. So again, he's very cognizant of the changes that, that have occurred and this need to rehabilitate the river because of what will happen to future generations. And so in these different scenes, we see, uh, again, this, this call for carencia, what Esteban Ariano says um, here, we didn't inherit the land from our parents, we have borrowed it from our kids. Um, and I, I really like that, again, that very forward thinking sentiment here, and the responsibility and the duty that people have to steward the lands for and the waters for future generations. And the film goes on to show these families again and, and how they are just very much uh, grateful for the lives that they have, grateful for the river, but you know, recognizing that, that they need to do some significant things to um, help sustain the current connections that they have. Okay. So I wanna shift now to uh, another uh, perspective here, uh, one of the other tributary voices that I look at, and this has to do with the basin's tribal nations. And there's a group that was formed in 1992 called the Colorado River Basin uh, Ten Tribes Partnership. And this includes uh, 10 of about the 29 or 30 federally recognized tribes within the basin. And these include the Ute Indian tribe, the Southern Ute, Hickorya, uh, the Diné or the Navajo, uh, the Fort Mojave, Chemehuevi, Colorado Indian, Ketchin and Cocopa tribes. Uh, that's both from kind of the upper basin and then the lower part of the watershed. And in 2018, they partnered with the Bureau of Reclamation to create this water study. And the Bureau of Reclamation had done this, uh, I think around 2012, that basically accounts for all the different water uses 
that uh, different entities have throughout the watershed. Uh, and the tribes decided to do this on their own uh, in 2018 to say, okay, these are our, uh, our particular needs because the tribes do hold a, a rather significant portion of the water within the, the watershed. So in putting together this study, they decided to do this um, so that they could kind of tell their own perspective rather than having the government write reports and talk about how uh, indigenous perspectives uh, may exist along the river. They're exerting their sovereignty essentially and saying, you know, this is our, this is our right, these are our waters, and this is our, our particular story. So this is a very different kind of uh, document. Okay, and this is the web page from the 10 tribes partnership. Um, and within the document that they put together with the Bureau of Reclamation, they have a vision statement. And the statement reads, water is life, water is the giver and sustainer of life. Water is a sacred and spiritual element to the tribes of the partnership. The creator instilled in the first peoples the responsibility of protecting the delicate, beautiful balance of Mother Earth for the benefit of all living creatures. Partnership will embrace and own the stewardship of the Colorado River and lead from a spiritual mandate to ensure that the sacred water will always be protected, available, and sufficient. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know how many water reports you've read, but this is a pretty stark departure from the typical kind of bureaucratic uh, language that you get within a water report, right? They're saying the creator instilled in the first peoples, right, this responsibility of protecting the river. Uh, and you never see something like that within a traditional government um, uh, report. So they're leading out on this kind of spiritual mandate um, to, to steward the water. And, and this is a really significant, significant thing here. And throughout the report, it's a, you know, hundreds of pages, each tribe kind of specifies their past needs uh, and their relationships with water, their current situation, and then what they project for the future. And in each of those cases, they, they tell their story um, of who they are as a people, of the very spiritual kind of connections to they have, that they have to place into the rivers within the watershed. So um, a rather, rather different perspective there. I also look here at this uh, digital campaign by the Grand Canyon Trust. This is a nonprofit organization that works throughout the Southwest. And they put together this Voices of Grand Canyon project a number of years ago, where they highlight these five individuals representing the Zuni, Hopi, Havasupai, Wallapai, and Navajo nations. And again, we see them telling their stories of their places of belonging and relationships. And so uh, Loretta Jackson Kelly, she's the woman that's in the turquoise dress. She talks about how for the Wallapai people, uh, the Colorado River is the backbone. And then without that backbone, we cannot survive. And so she goes on to talking about just how much identity is, is carried up in uh, these relationships to the river. And she makes it her work to dispel many of the stereotypes that exist about um, her people. Uh, like Jackson Kelly, Nikki Cooley, uh, she's the woman in the yellow dress. She seeks to dismantle myths about the West and indigenous peoples perpetuated by popular culture. Uh, her unique position as the first Navajo woman licensed as a Colorado River guide allows her to challenge her customers' beliefs that, as she explains, Native American culture was lore. It was John Wayne movies, right? So a lot of her work is educating misinformed tourists to help them understand her tribe's uh, historical past, the violence that they faced, but then their presence today in the ways that they have this ongoing relationship. And as she talks about the Grand Canyon and the river there, she says, it's a place of resilience in more than one sense and can teach us about the history of a people who are trying to survive, the people who lived, uh, persevered, and are still there today. And that's obviously one of the challenges that many Native peoples have is that there's this perception that they're somehow gone, right? There's just history and they're saying, wait a second, we're here, right? We, we have persevered, we are here, we um, have these relationships to the river and we own significant parts of, of the river. And uh, that needs to be taken into account. The last uh, tributary voice I wanna to touch on here quickly uh, stems from these other two. We've seen in the, the Latino perspective, in the native perspective, this kind of, spiritual relationship to the river. And so the last chapter I, I write has to do with thinking about water from a religious perspective and the ways in which religion 
uh, and religious studies and this kind of movement of religion and, eco and ecology should be part of these conversations. Um, and for you know, most people, they probably don't think of religion as having a role to play in our environmental issues. And uh, for those of you who study, again, literature and think about the field of eco-criticism, uh, that typically has not been uh, a perspective that most people think of. And a lot of that comes from an essay that was written in 1967 by Lynn White Jr. called The Historical Roots of Our Environmental Crisis, in which he basically kind of puts the blame on the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, he also, at the end, kind of looks to St. Francis as a way to um, find some ways of getting out of our problems, but most people don't focus on that. And they just kind of point the finger at religion and say, you know, this is, this is something that's caused the problems that we're in today. Um, but there are numerous individuals who are working against that. And this is uh, Yale's Forum on Religion and Ecology, a really significant kind of hub for all things religion and ecology. And if you're interested more in this, um, you know, you can find a lot of resources here. They even have a course offered through Coursera that introduces you through kind of four different classes uh, about religion and ecology. And they make the case that because the attitudes and values that shape people's concepts of nature primarily come from religious worldviews, and uh, we need religion as part of this particular conversation. And so building on what we see in the Latino perspective with the indigenous perspectives, my final chapter turns to focusing on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, and their notions of provident living and stewardship um, as a way to, again, think about water issues. And I, I focus on them um, in particular, and this is kind of some of their uh, leadership or excuse me, uh, statements about stewardship. I focus on them because uh, of their settlement within the Colorado River Basin historically. And John Wesley Powell, when he traveled through, uh, when Theodore Roosevelt uh, went to Salt Lake City in the early part of the 20th century, they were very much singing the praises of kind of the church in Utah as these models of how to use water wisely in the West. Well, things have very much changed in Utah. Um, it's one of the fastest growing states in the country. Uh, and Utah ha happens to have one of the highest uh, per capita uses of water. So this chapter is an attempt to kind of look back at the faith and some of the teachings there as a way to um, find new, new avenues forward. So that's kind of it with tributary voices. And, you know, as I think more about just river issues in general, um, you know, we're seeing a greater aridification happening throughout the American West and really across the globe. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Southern Colorado uh, giving a similar lecture to a university there. I was at the headwaters of the Rio Grande River. And uh, there are stretches of that river as it flows through New Mexico that are completely dry. And also as it flows into Texas that are completely dry. Uh, you may have seen images about the Mississippi River and how there are areas that have not been dry for, you know, centuries that are, that are exposed now. Uh, I have a, a student, a graduate student who's here from Iraq, and he's been telling me about the Tigris River back home and how because of dams and climate change and uh, just growing demands on the river there that it's drying up as well. You know, closer to home, we don't necessarily see that as much with the Missouri, but Nonetheless, we have been very much stuck in drought here. Uh, in September of this year, the Missouri was only running at about 47% of its long-term average. Um, and, you know, 90% of the Missouri River Basin is in drought. So, you know, a lot of issues here um, in terms of Nebraska and things happening in the state. There are some ongoing issues with the state of Colorado that Nebraska wants to build a canal. Uh, to take South Platte Water River uh, and bring it into Nebraska and store it kind of in the winter months so that it can be used for irrigation in the summer. And they wanna build that canal in Colorado to then up move water into Nebraska. You can see how that's contentious, but based on the compact of the South Platte River, that's, that's legal, but the governor of Colorado is getting into it. And, and so, you know, we can see that there's um, with water shortages, there's going to be conflicts. And, you know, there's some fascinating um, imaginative literature about, about this. Um, Paolo Basica Lupi's The Water Knife is a kind of a cli-fi climate fiction dystopian novel 
about the Colorado River and the American Southwest and what happens basically when it drives up, dries up and it has you know, all these different states fighting against each other and these mercenaries going after uh, water rights and it's kind of this crazy Mad Max kind of world that's uh, depicted. So, um, well, you know, hopefully that's something that happens. There are uh, a lot of concerns here. And, you know, as we've been talking about, there, there needs to be the best science. There's got to be great technology. There's got to be innovation. Um, but as one individual said in talking about some of the issues with the Ogallala Aquifer, right, that we also need transformations in social values. And that's what's going to help drive change. And I feel that uh, tributary voices and the role that the environmental humanities can play in this conversation can be uh, uh, an important part of that, of that change. So thank you very much. Do we have some questions for Dr. Formasano? I wish I could be there in person. It would be a lot more <laughs> engaging. I know it's kind of hard to listen to somebody talk through Zoom, but uh, no, I, I thought that was absolutely nice listening. So, no, I, I thought that was just uh, absolutely fascinating and uh, really relevant to not just the Colorado River Basin, but it sounds like, especially what you're talking about at the end, really all of us, and um, you know, we're all interconnected. And so, those I think the more of those stories that we get exposed to maybe the better. But one question I had was if, if people are entrenched in certain ways of thinking about the river, so you know, economic ways, um, property ways, uh, and storytelling is a way to kind of bring them into a different kind of awareness do we have to just tell better stories or do people need to be educated into how stories operate? And in other words, do people already have the, the innate mechanisms for understanding stories, but they just need to be exposed to more of them or? No, that's a great question. I think it's, I mean, it's both. We need, we need more stories. So we need these, you know, kind of marginalized perspectives and, and, and other stories that, you know, can imagine more, um, sustainable relationships with with a water source um, but you know I, I think as people who, who work in English departments you know you, you look at the number of students enrolling in those classes and and when I talk to students about you know do you read how much do you read you know that's not what people are doing or you know it's not the kind of reading um, maybe where they're, they're getting these, these kinds of stories. So I think, you know, that it's kind of a, a dual thing there where you're, you're needing greater exposure. Um, but I think there is a great need to, to help people understand how a story does work and, and why it's, why it's valuable. And, and those are, unfortunately, those are things that come with time, right? It's not a really quick fix. It's not something that's going to just happen, happen overnight. Um, but no, I, I really think that that's, that's why the humanities are so valuable um, because they, I think they both provide that, both that exposure, but also that training to recognize how those values are being um, represented um, and, and how we might interpret them. Uh, Paul, good evening, Pedro Marie. Uh, I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and my background is literature, especially presenting literature. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. And my view of the study when I was doing literary studies was the Amazon, the representation of the Amazon and presented literature. Your talk would be my talk about the Amazon word by word, and I kid you not. And even the slide that you have of the merging of the waters, as you probably know, if you look to the Nato River and the, the, the Maranon River that formed the Amazon, you, you have exactly the same type of uh, density, depth differences in, in different colors, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to think of differences. I think I thought of two, but maybe you know, you, you, your 
my answer will, will show me that there are, there are even fewer. One is that, at least in the case of the Amazon, there were uh, insiders producing literature. Mm -hmm. Not First Nations, of course, but people who have moved into the Amazon and who chronologically, historically, could already claim to be Amazon. Now, as you said, those voices are put in the background, those voices are not given credibility for, for different reasons. But their discourse was always a discourse of partner with us because we can help you, the outsider, understand what's going on. And it was never a confrontational discourse, but it was a discourse of trying to partner with. Mm -hmm. So that was one. I, I don't know if there's, there's that production about the Colorado, because who was there writing about the Colorado as a quote unquote native, you know, river belt? Okay. The second difference is in the discourse about the Amazon and, and you know the rhetoric of progress, and in, by that I mean the, the old traditional rhetoric of progress, you know, rather than just revolution and all that stuff. It's a rhetoric, rhetoric of substitution. So we're going to transform the Amazon into and then you know whatever it is. But the Colorado seems to be what what is is there a substitution? Because right now we're substituting it for sand or dryness. There's there's no project to substitute for anything else. Like in the Amazon, at least it's substituted for prairies and you know cities and urban scenarios and so on and so forth. So I, I think you're detecting these two differences, which for me make make it a very interesting uh, comparison. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I might, Brad, you may have to rephrase that second question for me a little bit because it was a little hard for me to hear, but. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I can just comment on that that first part if I if I understood it correctly. Um, what I think is interesting about what's happening with the the tribes and the indigenous peoples throughout the the um, the watershed right now is you know I mentioned that there's uh, they they have legal right to a significant amount of water within the watershed uh, about twenty five percent of of that water. They have not been able to use that water. Um, historically, just because of lack of infrastructure and right not having the funds or other things, but that is that is changing, and they are now trying to, what is called in water legal terms, perfect their rights. So they're saying, okay, now we want to start using those rights. And uh, I was just looking at an article before the presentation tonight in Arizona, where you know there's there's a rather antagonistic relationship that exists there, um, because those cities don't want the tribes using that water that they historically have been using because the tribes couldn't. Now, some of the other tribes are trying to say, you know, we want to use our, we want to figure out kind of our water needs and then we'll be willing to work with others. So um, there's, I think we're going to see some, some conflict and certainly a lot of lawsuits um, because of, of those, um, you know, the historical Use that non-Indians have been have been using, um, and now tribes saying, "Wait a second, this is historically ours. It's legally ours, and, and we're going to put that to use." And uh, cities, you may have to begin to uh, take some hits. And, and that was said. I was at a watching a water conference uh, a few weeks ago, where uh, some members of tribes from New Mexico and Colorado basically said that to the people in the in the um, in the audience that you know you've been using our water, and now it's time for us to finally you know, use what's what's legally ours. So um, you were kind of talking about some of those partnerships. And again, I may have missed a little bit what you were what you were saying there. But, um, you know, I, I think there's definitely a willingness, there has to be a willingness to work with the tribes. And they're very much saying we need to be at the table, uh, because historically, they they haven't been. So I think that's a really fascinating area that's that's going to be playing out here in the future. Hey, Brad, hey, George, if, if I'm not, yeah, correct me if I'm paraphrasing this the wrong way, but my understanding was that you were talking in the Amazon basin that if if there's a lack of water, if there's a drying up in certain areas of the Amazon, those become sort of multi-use areas. There's still 
places where cities or farms or um, well, and, the, the, the discourse about the Amazon was produced mainly by outsiders. Okay. And the outsider viewing it as and you, you know you mentioned this in your book, Paul, the the, 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 the the metaphors of empty vastness, or in the case of the Amazon, the green hell, or the opposite, the paradise, and and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, right? Which is which be an imposition of desire onto somebody else's reality. Right? That's that's the ideological mm -hmm. uh, transport, right? So so this discourse of progress about the Amazon is an imposition of an external desire on the domain. But at least in the Amazon, you have native voices. Native, right? I can't, not native, not those natives. We have Amazonian voices saying, hey, it's not that you're wrong, but you're wrong in not partnering with us. But at least they have the scientific, the, the environmental, the cultural knowledge to bring something to the table. That's not you know, traditional history or religion, you know, something more concrete that the Western outsider could relate to more. So I, I'm very pessimistic about the Colorado based on what you're saying, because what is being brought to the table as, as the, the leverage or the, you know, the, what can be exchanged for support for more inventive, environmentally uh, responsible action. Because if we continue as societies and as humans to, to, to use the yardstick that everything is for economic and consumerism, is for economic gain and consumerism, I mean, that, we're never going to get away from how, how it's run. Yeah, I'm having a kind of hard time to catch in those last little bit. It's kind of fading out. Sorry about that. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it was. You know, thinking about your insider outsider kind of comments about about the Amazon. Um, I mean, yeah, our our early narratives certainly came from quote unquote outsiders, right? Various explorers, the Spanish, and and then later uh, those working for the U.S. government as topographers trying to map these regions. Um, but you know, I, I think more in terms of how the, the real kind of knowledge that we have about the river literarily that's that's been more influential or have been those uh, voices that have uh, come out kind of more on the environmental side. Um, the Edward Abbeys, the Terry Tempest Williams, um, and, and then of course, many native writers, Natalie Diaz, uh, Ophelia Zepeda, others who are you know writing about these, these relationships, more kind of a recent phenomenon. Um, but uh, you know, I think they're they're providing us important, again, kind of important reminders about about those relationships uh, that need to exist and that have existed for obviously uh, certain groups, and that I see those as as valuable as providing some of that reorientation. So again, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm missing some of the because of the sound. Uh, I'm hearing what you're what you're saying in the back of the room. So. You got everything I said. I, 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 and thank you for a fascinating talk. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I just, I just had a quick question. I was thinking about your uh, uh, question of, uh, or your comment about the Indian tribe uh, being able to access their portion of, of uh, water. And, uh, and I can't think of any situation in Nebraska where we have tribes able to do that. And I, as I thought about it, I thought it's because the tribes have been moved, you know, historically in this part of the country from one place to another away from their home area. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in your area, have tribes been basically in the same place so they can they can do that and they can declare uh, right. over, the, over the 250, 200 years? Yeah. Well, so some within the water should have. So if you take some of the Pueblo peoples, um, in New Mexico, of course, they're kind of on the Rio Grande, but um, or those uh, in Arizona, the Hopi, for example, they were not moved. So they're on their historic, you know, kind of kind of homelands. Um, the Wallapai, the Havasupai, they're people that live south of the Grand Canyon, the reservation south of the Grand Canyon. They're still where they always have been, although obviously their lands have been reduced significantly. 
but other tribes have been moved. Um, various Ute tribes were moved from Colorado to Utah um, and others in, in some various areas. So really what the, the issue is that they have water rights based on this Supreme Court doctrine that goes back a ruling back to 1908. It's called the Winters Doctrine. And that ruling states that uh, water and land can't be separated. And so when a federal reservation was created, um, the water rights go to the date of the creation of that reservation. And in the American West, the way the water law works is it's this idea of first in time, first in right, or prior appropriation. And so if you basically went to a place and you filed to use a certain amount of water, whatever date that was, let's say it was 1900, and then somebody comes after you, even if they live upstream from you, if they filed on that water later, you have the senior right and you're able to use that as much as you filed for. And if that means you dry up the person downstream, then you can do that because you have that legal right. And so the issue with tribal water is that they have, because their reservations were created in many cases before any cities were in the West, um, they have these old historic rights. And so, um, you know, they, they predate uh, many, many of the cities. So that's, that's really the issue is that um, even if they were moved from their traditional homelands, wherever they were relocated, their reservations uh, have those senior, those senior rights. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Formasano. It's been a pleasure and we've learned a lot and I'm teaching environmental literature next semester and I'm definitely gonna be talking about this, so. Excellent. Well, thanks again, everybody. I appreciate you hanging on a little late tonight and hope you uh, stay warm and safe. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, really. Yep, same to you, take care. Right, I have a